Hey, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. Today, we're continuing our series on all the 16 Myers-Briggs personality types. And today, we're talking about the ISFJ personality in the Myers-Briggs system, or the memory harmony personality in the personality hacker system. ISFJs are really interesting characters. And I think that it's easy to overlook just how quirky that they can be. But we got a lot of responses in from our survey and there were a couple things that came up over and over again and quirky was not one of them (laughs) the the biggest theme that we seem to see from our survey results was how sensitive isfjs feel how much they you know they really want to be in a relationship with with somebody else or they really want to have friendships and they really want to socialize But they find themselves getting overtaxed easily. They find themselves having a difficult time articulating their feelings. And I think it's really, I think this is going to be a really helpful podcast for ISFJs out there trying to figure out why they might have this sort of yin-yang relationship with relationships and socializing and trying to communicate where they're coming from and, and really wanting those relationships, but then at the same time feeling so overwhelmed by them. So you want to get right into the car model and then do a bit of a breakdown of some of the ways that the, the cognitive functions in the car model show up for this type. Yeah, if you've been following along with all of our type-based podcasts, you'll know that we use a car model. It's just a way, it's a visual way to look at how your mind is wired and your personality is constructed. And in this car model, we use it to illustrate the mental processes that your mind is using to learn information and make decisions. So we're, we're gonna go through this, hoping that you have reference for this. And the way you would get reference from this is if you go over our website, personalityhacker.com, and you type in the search bar, car model, you'll find some resources that you can read and see a visual representation of what we're talking about here. And and that will really help you get started in, in unpacking your personality as an ISFJ if you follow along with the visual reference. Right, and the CAR model is a way to understand what is technically called your cognitive function stack. So you may have seen the word, the phrase cognitive function in other places or cognitive functions. And as Joel mentioned, those are the mental processes that you're using that inform and influence your personality the most. So in the car model, there's a driver, a co-pilot. Behind the co-pilot sits a 10-year-old and behind the driver sits a three-year-old. So each of these refers to a different way that you understand and experience reality. So the driver process for an ISFJ is a cognitive function that is technically called introverted sensing, but we've nicknamed it memory. Now, the way that this works is introverted sensing is a, it's it's called a perceiving process, or it's a way for you to take in information and understand it. It informs how you learn new information and basically where you're going to be putting your attention. And the way that introverted sensing works. And if you want to get a more of a deep dive into the, how this process works, we did a podcast called The Sensing Personality Types, and we go into the memory process and really break down why we call it memory and how that works. But fundamentally, it's your senses, right? So that would be more than just your five senses. That would also include sense of time and balance and basically any any instrument inside of your body that is trying to figure out what's going on in the real world. And then it introverts it or internalizes the information that it's just captured for review. And that's why we call it memory, because it's it's about taking in information and then processing it inside of oneself in almost like a post-processing way. So you capture what's going on around you, you capture your sense impressions, and then you review it. And the reason why this happens, you know, like as a review process as opposed to an in in the moment process, like maybe extroverted sensing or sensation would work for SPs, is because people who use the introverted sensing or memory process are very interested in what is reliable. And what is more reliable than what you have personally experienced and then had time to review it, had time to figure out what it meant to you, had time to, re- you know, review what, where you've seen this before and what it, what the meaning could be for you as an individual. So what ends up happening is all of the things that you pay attention to, all of your sense impressions that you've now internalized or brought into your inner world and then reviewed now become a part of who you are. They're now a part of your experience. They're, they're part of your memory or your memory stack. And over time, what's interesting is that, and, and I say this from the perspective as an ENTP, 
what, who is ostensibly, right, if you just look at the four dichotomies, I'm ostensibly the exact opposite type of an ISFJ. And people who are ENPs oftentimes are called some of the most flexible or some of the most adaptable. But my observation has been that people who lead with this process of introverted sensing or memory are actually some of the most adaptable types over time because you are incorporating your impressions of the world, you're incorporating your experiences, and then they become a part of who you are. So if you're in a situation for an extended amount of time, that situation is now a part of you. That's part of how you see yourself. And this is why people who lead with this process will oftentimes say things like, you can tell a lot about a person by the family they came from. Because the family you grew up in is a major part of your experience, and so therefore it's a major part of your identity. And so ISFJs lead with this process. And because it's a perceiving process, or it's a learning or information gathering process, then ISFJs, even though they're judger types and you can get a lot of stereotypes around, you know, how judgers show up and how they think that the world should be a certain way. I would argue that ISFJs are actually rather open to new information, especially if they don't feel threatened. If their past has not taught them to feel threatened by the world or to feel maybe a little xenophobic, if they've had good experiences over time, and they have no reason to feel threatened, they're actually rather open to new experiences. And what ends up capturing their attention is so uniquely individualized to them that this is where, this is why I said at the beginning, we undervalue how quirky they can be. Because your your personal individual experiences craft you into a totally unique person that in, ends up getting into stuff that's totally unique to you or a little bit quirky. And that's why people who lead with this process can sometimes get into, like really get into things and become world class at them without even realizing it because they've incorporated so much information and data around this one thing that's taking their attention, this one thing that they see as part of their identity, that all of a sudden they know more than anybody else about this one subject. Like, I don't know, maybe you're just really into collecting records and now you've got this extensive record collection because that's just become a part of how you see yourself and records were really important to you as a child and you really like how music you know, shows up in a very analog way with records and now all of a sudden you've got like the biggest record collection of anybody you know or you're super into model trains and then all of a sudden you know, you, you know more about model trains than anybody else on the planet. So this is why I say it becomes kind of quirky is you end up integrating these these things that capture your attention that you want to gather more information around and that becomes so much a part of your identity that you just keep pursuing it and now you know more than anybody else about this thing. For you as an ISFJ, as you move through the world, one of the things, because you're, because you're looking at the world almost in a post-processing way, you absorb a lot of information and you process it internally through that memory or introverted sensing process that Antonio's talking about, that's a lot of work to reconcile all the information coming to you through the real world. Like all of that sensory data is, is important at, for you and to sort through that can be a challenge. So what I think a lot of ISFJs end up doing is relying on what, what I would call templates to view the world. Because it's such, a lo- it's such hard work to reconcile all the sensory information coming in and then post-processing it, because it's exhausting, for, to, to do that with every single piece of information would take forever for you. It takes a little bit of time. So what you end up doing is creating, you create templates of how you see things and categories and buckets of how you see things. And you categorize things before you start to post-process them. So you can reject or accept the information first so that it lessens the work you have to perceive your world or see your world. So how does this look? This looks, this shows up in things like traditions, for example, around the holidays maybe, around how... Uh, seasons of the year come, certain ways that relationships should be or how to get a job or it doesn't really matter what the thing is. But in your mind, you construct templates and, and frameworks of how you see the world to make it easier for you to move through new information all the time. So you take a piece of information, say, where have I seen this piece of information before? Do I have any experience with this piece of information? If you have, you categorize it, and then you post-process it in that category. If you don't have any experience with that information, you say, I don't really have a category for this. You can either reject it wholesale, or you can sit it on like a little 
a little shelf that says, you know, attend to later type thing. I don't really know what to do with this piece of information yet. I don't have a pre-done category for it or a pre-done template for this. So I'm not exactly sure how to post-process this yet. So I'm going to put it over to the shelf. Over time, I think when we when we talk about it being adaptable, you're adding more and more and more templates, more and more categories to how you see information coming in for you. And I think the older you get, the more you can adapt and see new information in all of these categories that you've been building your entire life. So as you mature, I think you get you get better at knowing where this fits in your world and how you see your world, basically, from a sensory standpoint. Yeah, I think when people of this type allow themselves or open themselves up to a lot of new information or new experiences, I don't think they're ever going to be people who like rush to be mavens of new technologies or rush to be mavens of new experiences. I think there's a lot of wisdom for them to like sort of hold back and see how others fare and then, you know, test the waters themselves. I think that they're in their best selves when they do that. However, I've noticed that when they aren't, they don't reject new things wholesale, they get sort of this really magnanimous relationship with novelty. It's not that they're going to rush in and do it themselves necessarily, but they have no problem with other people doing it. It doesn't threaten them personally. They understand that this novelty or this new experience just has to be understood. And like you said, you can kind of put it on a shelf for a little while and study it and and not necessarily have an antagonistic relationship with newness, but rather just sort of have a, a like a, a distant curiosity. <laughs> like, yeah, that's that's something that other people are doing right now. And I'm going to kind of see how they, it turns out for them. And, and then I'll see how I fare and, and maybe I'll do that thing or maybe I won't and, and it'll be okay. But I think if they've had trauma in their past or have had negative situations over and over and it's taught them to maybe see the world as being hostile, I think that's really when they have an antagonistic relationship with novelty or newness because that new thing can be threatening to you. And so you don't, you know, you don't, you don't want to venture out if that thing is going to be threatening. So it really is more about how the ISFJ is imprinted with either the universe is friendly or the universe is hostile. And that's a really important imprint for them. If they have a universe is friendly imprint, then you're not going to see somebody who has a lot of a lot of antagonism towards newness. Now, what's interesting about this driver process is that, you know, I mentioned before, you could get really into maybe like toy train sets or something to that effect or model train sets and then become the world class at that. Well, what I've noticed is that that tends to be more towards the ISTJ type, which we'll end up doing in a future podcast. I've noticed that because ISFJs are feelers and their co-pilot process is a feeling process, they end up becoming experts of the people in their lives. And so that co-pilot process for an ISFJ is technically called extroverted feeling, but we call it harmony. And this is a process that is very focused on understanding human relationships and human dynamics. It's about understanding how people relate to each other, how we impact each other on an emotional level, how we, you know, not just impact one to one, but also in group dynamics or family dynamics. And because because people who have this process are so sensitive to emotional interplay and emotional dynamics, that's why we named it harmony because that ends up becoming the focus. That ends up becoming the way that they make decisions. How am I going to ensure that the people in my life you know, all, all these people who I have relationships with and they have relationships with each other. How am I going to make sure that I make decisions that encourage everybody to be in a harmonious relationship? And so I've noticed that ISFJs become masters of almost predicting the behavior of the people who are close to them. They they watched and observed their behavior so often and they've observed the interplay so much that they can start to predict how people in like their family dynamic are going to show up. Well, you know, for Christmas, Uncle Bob is going to show up maybe just a little bit tipsy and that's going to make, you know, Grandpa Ralph like get really frustrated and and then, you know, my Aunt Susan's going to rush in and she's going to try to like make smooth everything over, but then you'll notice my dad showing up in this way. Like they they've seen this dynamic happen so often that they recognize what's going to happen because that is taking their focus. And then they ask themselves, what can I do if I can do anything? What can I do to smooth the whole thing over beforehand? How can I make sure that my uncle doesn't show up tipsy? Like what are some of the things that I could do to try to encourage people to show up as their best self and keep morale up? And so this becomes a really 
uh, it becomes an evaluative criteria for making all of their decisions. How do I show up in a way that makes sure that I create harmony for other people? Now, if you are focused on harmony, if you're focused on making sure everybody has a great relationship, and you're leading with a process that really adapts and incorporates other people's um, you know, behaviors and how they're showing up. And you're super, you're really quite sensitive to how people are showing up in the world and you're incorporating that as to part of your identity. ISFJs can have a very similar phenomenon that INFJs do, only it's for the people they love. Now, when we talk about INFJs, one of the, one of the things we really focus in on is I, the INFJ ability to unconsciously absorb other people's emotions. And that includes for strangers. Like they've got their feeler up, they have their introverted intuition or perspective feelers so so finely tuned that it could be a total stranger that walks into a room in an upset mood and the INFJ feels it. ISFJs don't quite have that sensitivity for strangers. They don't have quite that sensitivity for people who are outside of their, you know, of their basically their personal dynamic, like the, the people they have relationships with. But that same phenomenon can carry over to ISFJs with the people they love. So they become very sensitive to the emotional energy of the people in their life, and they can absorb those people's emotions. In fact, that's something that they really struggle with, is how do I make it so that when my mate, my spouse, my children, my parents, my friends, how do I make it when they're having these really like kind of terrible moods or or these really down time periods or they're really upset and angry, how do I make it so I can hold space for them and not match their emotion, like not absorb their emotion and now make it my emotion like my husband was really angry but now I'm really angry because he was angry and and now I'm all upset and I don't even know what I'm angry about I just know he was angry (laughs) or you know my daughter is feeling really down and now I'm feeling really down and I know that I wasn't feeling down before she was and so it's a really similar phenomenon to INFJs but it's generally reserved for the people in their life. So ISFJs are really good at holding space for, well, for everyone they come in contact with. They, they do have a sense of strangers and other people. But like you mentioned, people that are close to them, it's very important that they're looking to meet the needs of the ones they love and the ones that are close to them in their life. Now, as an ISFJ listening, you know that's how this goes down, right? You spend so much time meeting the needs of the people around you that sometimes you forget, well, you don't forget yourself, but you realize that you take a second position or you take a back seat or or a side burner on the stove, you know, metaphorically speaking. You don't get your needs met sometimes when you are meeting so many other people's needs. And that can cause burnout. That can cause discouragement. That can cause just total uh, inability to meet the needs of the people around you. So one of the one of the important things, one of the things we really encourage ISFJs to do is take the time to to meet your own needs, to realize that you are not going to be capable of meeting the other people's needs in your life if you're not attending to your own needs also. And I can just hear you right now as an ISFJ saying, yeah, but there's so much to do. I've got to do all these things for all these other people and for the different communities I'm involved with and maybe my job. How am I ever going to find time for myself? And yet, if you don't include yourself in everybody, I think, and that's really the key here, is it's not other people and you. It's getting everybody's needs met, and you're part of everybody. And if you include yourself in that equation, just just flip that little switch in your mind to say, oh, yeah, I'm part of everyone. My needs are important just like my spouse's needs or my children's needs or my coworker's needs. And I need to attend to those as well. So what would you do to meet the needs of your child? If you have to take them to the doctor's appointment, you block off time in your calendar, and you spend time meeting those needs. Well, do the same thing for yourself. Find time for yourself. Find time to incorporate yourself into everyone and, and spend time meeting the needs for yourself. The other piece of this is getting really sophisticated or working on becoming more sophisticated, let's put it that way, on creating good boundaries for yourself, saying no more often. I'm sure you found yourself as an ISFJ so desiring to meet the needs of people around you that when you're asked something, maybe last minute, hey, can you do this thing for me? Or hey, can you be here at this party this day? I really need your support. Yeah, I'll do that. And you say yes. And then a couple hours later, you look at yourself and you're like, oh my gosh, what did I just commit myself to? Now I, I've i said yes to something that's going to cause stress or take time. But setting boundaries for yourself, setting clear boundaries about what you're going to take on is going to be part of that meeting need part for yourself. Like getting your own needs met is going to be important with boundary setting. And that's really a key there. One of the things we got back on the survey 
from ISFJs was this struggle with perfection. A lot of ISFJs said, I feel this need to be perfect. I feel this need to be a perfectionist when I show up to the world. And I don't think that's necessarily natural for you as an ISFJ. I don't think you innately feel perfectionistic. But I think there's a, this there's this loop you can get caught in as an ISFJ where you feel that other people are dependent on you for a great experience. Because remember that that memory process that you lead with, that that process of of understanding your your past, your ties to the past, tradition, the things that matter to you, and the experiences you've had. You want other people to have really positive memories when they come to a holiday event or they you know, interact with you in the office or whatever they're doing. You want them to feel good about that. You want them to have a good memory of that experience. And so, and you want to meet the needs of the people around you. So you, you have a tendency to feel pressure to make sure everything is perfect for the people around you and their experiences. I can imagine, I don't, I'm not an ISFJ, but I can imagine as an ISFJ, this can be overwhelming sometimes. You feel so much burden to ensure that the people around you are having a perfect experience so they'll remember this really optimized, amazing time that they've had. I, I remember this video we watched a while back, and Tony and I saw this video. You might have seen it. It was on YouTube. I think it went viral. It was a woman who was being interviewed about, about a Thanksgiving holiday she'd invited her family to. I, I believe the woman was probably an ISFJ. And she was talking about the different, she was talking about the assignments she had given the different family members, her sisters, her sister-in-laws, her brothers, her brother-in-laws, of what kind of food items to bring for this family event she was hosting. And she had organized where people were going to sit. She had organized all the details of this, and she was giving out information, and, and she was being interviewed. I think the people who were interviewing were kind of poking fun at her a little bit because she was so intense, and she was talking about how, you know, you need to bring a regulation size casserole dish and with this size spoon, it cannot be a small spoon. It can't be an oversized spoon. It's this specific size spoon and this specific size casserole dish that's regulation size or something like a word like that, right? Regulation. And the person interviewing her said, well, what's regulation? And she was like, well, everybody knows it's it's this metric, whatever the size was, you know, so many quarts or so many, you know, half gallons or whatever it is. And she kept giving these metrics and all these details about the perfect situation of how people were supposed to bring food to this event. And, and Tony and I were talking about it, and we're like, wow, that is really, she, she seemed intense, but it looked like she was really trying to handle the situation for her family so they had a really good experience by giving it precision and optimization to the holiday event. I think it was like Thanksgiving. And the one person was asking her about another family member who didn't really always follow along with her intent. Like they just, they didn't get a regulation size casserole. They just showed up with whatever, Right. And they said, so what do you think about this family member? And she, she, re, she wanted to be negative about this family member, but she, she was very careful because this is somebody she's mapped to, that she was close to. She didn't want to be critical of them. So she was very careful to say, well, they're, they're, you know, they're not that personality that's so there. They're, you know, she kind of breathed, gave a sigh, a little frustration. And I, I kind of make space for them because that's just who they are, basically is how she answered. And she gave them some grace. And so I think all of this, this is a great story to illustrate some of the stuff that ISFJs, they they map themselves to people closely and they want people to have a really good experience. And so when this persnickety nature comes up, this perfectionistic nature comes up, I don't think it's personal. I don't think it's something that they're just being a jerk about or they're being you know, obtuse or they're being... F- f- finicky or fussy, just just to be finicky or fussy. They really want to get the needs of the people around them met. And you may have seen yourself or other ISFJs in various stages of this, right? Uh, another example of this, because ISFJs want people to have such a great experience. And when this when this happens, you know, on extreme case, you can see people, you know, ISFJs may be covering their furniture with plastic, for example. Where does all this come from? Why is this, why is this something that ISFJs do? Uh, w- sitting right behind that co-pilot of Harmony is a process that we've nicknamed accuracy. Its technical name is introverted thinking. And introverted thinking has about a 10-year-old development for you as an ISFJ in your personality. What introverted thinking does well when it's used by somebody that this is a driver or co-pilot, it's it's concerned with metrics and data, like information void of any kind of human connection. It's just about data and just for data's sake. But when this sits at your 10-year-old process level as an ISFJ, what ends up happening is that data comes down to things like the size of a casserole dish 
or making sure things are perfectly organized or optimized for memories to be created and for harmony to be created for the people you love and that you're around. And so it can end up being couched in a way or brought up in a way of a perfectionistic nature. You can tend to see it come up for ISFJs of them skipping past their harmony process and going straight to this and making decisions around how they host things, how they show up to things, and creating an environment that they want to see optimized. But other people don't see it that way because remember, it's void of any emotion. All they see is the quote unquote persnickety nature or the fussy nature. And they're like, why is this person so fussy? Well, they're not fussy. They're just trying to use that accuracy process to really optimize the experience for the people they love. Yeah, this is the 10-year-old process we oftentimes call the defensive position. And it's because we use it when we're trying to avoid something that is unpleasant. It could be a situation or it could be a piece of information. It's just when we act in general defensive about the world. And so for an ISFJ, the thing they're defending against is, just like you mentioned, Joel, it's they want to be above reproach. They want to be in a situation where nobody could blame them. If something bad happens or if morale is low or if an argument, you know, breaks out or whatever, they can't look at the ISFJ and go, well, you didn't you didn't do a good enough job. Like you should have done better or you should have done, you know, you should have done more in order to make sure that nobody was feeling conflict or discord. And so the ISFJ goes, okay, I'm going to I'm going to make everything as optimized and as perfect as humanly possible. And that way they can't blame me. I can't be at fault for this. But the problem is, is that when you put plastic on the couch, that's not really an optimized experience for the people who are sitting on the couch. (laughs) Like, that's incredibly uncomfortable. And so it ends up losing the original intent, which was to make sure that everybody had a good experience, a good memory to go away with. It ends up losing that intent uh, because now it's all about being above reproach and making sure if somebody didn't have a perfect experience, it wasn't your fault. So that's a very defensive position. If you remove the plastic off the couch, yeah, maybe something's going to spill on it. Maybe you could have a situation where, you know, a person in their visual in their visual field sees a couch that's not, you know, perfectly you know, pristine and maybe the couch, like the cushions are a little bit like somebody slept on them and so they're a little rumpled or whatever. But that lived in feel is actually much closer to how we naturally want to be as people. And so in order to preserve a good situation and a a good memory, that harmony process is so important because now you're actually meeting people where they're at. What is their need? Is their need to sit on a pristine plastic covered couch Or is there a need to be able to just kind of chill and sit and rest and know that the couch is comfy and they can kick their feet up if they want to? So that's why it's so important to make sure that your harmony process is strong and powerful and well-developed so you don't end up in that perfectionistic streak in order to, you know, go, well, it wasn't my fault. If things go wrong, it wasn't me. Well, that's a very defensive position to take. Instead going, well, I'm just going to show up the best I can and then I'm going to allow other people to have whatever whatever emotions they're going to have. And I'm going to do my part to make sure to meet people where they're at. And then I'm not going to take responsibility if they're having a bad time of it. And that's where the, those boundaries come in. The boundaries of recognizing that you're not responsible for everybody's emotions all the time. You're not responsible for ha- them having a good time. You can help influence it, right? And and that's going to be important for you is to want to influence the situation so that people feel as good as possible, but it's not really your responsibility to make sure that they're having a good time. That's really on them as individuals. Now, there's a positive side. I mean, there's this isn't actually negative. What we're talking about is accuracy process. This is just something that could be a blind spot a little bit, something that can trip you up as an ISFJ. Oftentimes, though, this accuracy process for you as an ISFJ can show up in a, a really positive way. I know a lot of ISFJs that are, I'll call them the family manager or the budgeter for the family. They, they really they do all the taxes or the finances for the family. This is a process that can help you with that. And this is something that I think a lot of ISFJs enjoy doing, you know, whether you're male or female, and you get kind of handed the responsibility of making sure that the checkbook's balanced or the budget is kept. Or, you know, there's a there's a there's a trip coming up for your family on vacation and, you know, certain arrangements need to be made in a sequence that's going to make the trip optimized for everyone to get their needs met and have a really fun time. Uh, we were we were at Disney recently, and I was I was watching a lot of ISFJs working with their families to get in a great position for the fireworks at night. They were using this accuracy process to say, I know if if I stand my family on this corner, you know, on Main Street USA at Disney World in Florida, 
we'll have the best vantage point for the fireworks. Everyone's going to get their needs met because I'm optimizing this experience. So I don't, I don't want us to give the impression that this is always negative or it's you know something that's always perfectionistic. A lot of times this shows up very positive for you as an ISFJ. The important thing to remember is that you're using this process, this accuracy process, in support of that harmony process and not the other way around. If you, if you skip past the harmony process and you go straight to this accuracy process to make your decisions and to plan things and to optimize things, and you skip past that harmony process, well, then you're, I think that's where you get that perfectionistic streak. But if you look at the harmony process first and you say, I want my family to have a great experience with the fireworks at Disney, how can I make sure that happens? Ah, I know. I've done the research. I've read all the reviews online. I've talked to my friends and I know this is the place that's going to make that experience great for us. And use that accuracy process in support of your harmony process. Now you're talking about superpowers. You're talking about you showing up as an ISFJ, like literally like super person. Like this is awesome. You're doing that. Yeah. Another thing I've seen is a lot of ISFJs in like early education or in nursing roles uh, or basically where you have to really know your stuff in order to give people a great experience or the best experience that they can have considering the circumstances like in a hospital or an emergency situation. So I've noticed that ISFJs can really utilize that accuracy process or introverted thinking by collecting a lot of information and data about the, you know, about their career or the thing that they're focused on, and then also collecting a lot of information and data in order to teach other people. Um, I, I know of an ISFJ that just recently became a doula, and she loves it. And that's all about supporting, you know, women in the time of pregnancy and educating them on what's coming up for them and really needing a lot of education around that process in order to get women's needs met at the time period of, um, you know, possibly one of the most scary time periods of their life. So I've noticed that the accuracy process shows up really well in that too. Now, speaking of Disney, that actually makes me think of the three-year-old process in the car for an ISFJ. And that three-year-old process is the opposite of the driver. Its technical name is extroverted intuition, but we've called it exploration. And I've noticed that ISFJs, again, when they feel safe, when they're in a situation where they feel like maybe the universe is friendly or the context is friendly, they can really have a very exploratory side to them. They can be very much into creativity and possibilities thinking. I've noticed that ISFJs are frequently very artistic. Um, they can do this in sort of a, a Martha Stewart style of way where their houses are absolutely ridiculously gorgeous and um, they can do it in sort of a crafty way. Uh, men who are ISFJs can do this by being very creative in, you know, in their work or how they show up for their families. And they like having a good time. They have sort of not a, I wouldn't call it a wild side, but I would call it a freedom side, like a place where they just really like to go play with their kids. And I saw that showing up at Disney over and over. You saw a lot of ISFJs, men and women with their families, and they were just letting go and having a good time and letting everybody just explore and experience something that's fun and creative and, and you know, the, what does Disney call it in their commercials? Like your Disney side? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and I, and I think that they bring that flavor to their lives in general. The only problem that they can run into is if they're utilizing this in a time period of stress, they can, this can show up as being very impulsive. It can show up as them making decisions just on the – something that will be outside of the norm – something that's really super impulsive, um, something that might not be the best decision for themselves. And you can notice that sometimes it shows up in shopping, wanting to have something new. And so they have like a, a desire for novelty and they'll just go out and buy something that maybe wasn't the best decision for them, you know, financially. Uh, there's also in extreme cases, this is sort of the weird ISFJ phenomenon of like running off to Vegas and getting married to the wrong person <laughs> just to like make some, you know, make a decision that's different than the norm. And in a time period of high stress, you can do that. You can like make these really crazy impulsive decisions that you know are not right for you. So it's really best to make sure that you're using your exploration side in a more creativity oriented space as opposed to an impulsive space one of the things that my friend uh used to say is if you're going to exploration as a three-year-old you know go ahead and paint the kitchen a different color don't run off to vegas and get married so feel free to use this in a creative way but not necessarily in an impulsive way 
There was an interesting comment on the survey, shifting gears a little bit. I, I don't want to discount what you just said at all. That was all great stuff. I just This just came to my mind about um, ISFJs, I believe, feel invisible sometimes. I think as you move through the world, you have a, you have because you are so good at getting other people's needs met, and like Antonia mentioned at the very beginning of the podcast, you're adaptable over time. So you, you map yourself to the people that you love, and you get needs met, and oftentimes people forget to get your needs met. Oftentimes people forget that you're in the equation because you're so good at what you do. So you know, one, one obviously thing is you need to articulate the needs you have to your spouse, to your children, to the people around you. And the other thing is, in a particular work context, someone said, it was a really, it was a comment that stood out to me. This ISFJ wrote on the, on the survey, they said, one of the struggles I have is that my coworkers don't realize the, the depth and the knowledge I have for the institutional memory of the workplace I work at. In other words, this person has spent enough years at their job that they know a lot of stuff about how everything works in the office, how everything works in the business that they work in. And I think they're disappointed because when there's decisions to be made or information to learn, no one comes to their desk and says, what do you think about this? Do you have any understanding of how these things work, having worked here for the last 10 years? And I think ISFJs have a, a great knack for either institutional or family or you know community knowledge and information, it's almost like they're walking encyclopedias sometimes of information. And I think that a lot of times we undervalue you as ISFJs, you as an ISFJ, in how much of that you actually possess. You probably have more family history under your belt than most people in your family because you're an ISFJ. You remember those things. They're important to you. What your grandmother or great-grandmother did as a tradition is important to you, and you've probably remembered that, and it's something you might even still do now, four generations later. Or at your job, there's a procedure or a way of doing things, a culture, a information that the, the business needs to run or your, your job needs to function. You remember these things over time, and you have a lot of great stuff in these contexts. I mean, you've got great, great stuff everywhere, but a lot of great stuff in these contexts. And I think one of the things that I would encourage you to do is be vocal about that. When there is a decision made at work and you have all this institutional information, speak up and say, hey, you guys remember, we tried this 10 years ago and here's the results. I'm not saying we don't want to try it again now, but here's some of the ways that we've tried this in the past. Here's the ways that this has come out. I just want you guys to know this information. I think this is important as we make these decisions. I think this is really a superpower you have that most people don't realize about you. And they're not going to come to you and go, you know what? I think you might have a great handle on the institutional memory for our business. They're not going to come to you and, and think to say that. So we're going to have to find ways for you to be able to do that on your end. Yeah, I that assertiveness is tough for some ISFJs to develop. I totally understand that. And th I think that's another way that that harmony or extroverted feeling process really shows up positively for them because it encourages them to be assertive. It's their ex it's their strongest extroverted process. It, while you were talking, what came up for me was this idea that a lot of ISFJs, again, you lead with that memory process. That means that you're going to be very adaptable over time. And as I mentioned earlier, that can sometimes be not a good thing. Like you can adapt to some pretty crappy situations. And I think when an ISFJ feels that they have an obligation to adapt to their circumstances, that they're not allowed to be assertive and stand up and go, yeah, that's probably not okay for me. Like, I'm not all right with that anymore. I really need to make sure I'm getting my needs met. I need to be setting boundaries. If they don't develop that to a healthy extent, they really believe that it's their job to just sit there and let crap get piled on top of them. And I think that's one of the reasons why ISFJs can sometimes feel like martyrs. Like it's their job to be in a bad situation. It's their job to just allow other people to take advantage of them and they don't know what to do about it. And that's one thing that ISFJs really need to watch out for. It's something that may have been insinuated to you at some point and you just allowed yourself to believe it or your just natural wiring encouraged you to go that direction and you had maybe some trauma in the past and you feel that that's you know that's what you're calibrated to so that's who you must be is somebody who experienced trauma and you're just bringing that to to the future 
it is so important for you to understand and acknowledge that that's not your fate. You are not fated to anything. You don't have to deal with anything negative and just assume that that's your position in life. It's very, very, very important to get into that harmony process and go, wait a minute, I'm part of everyone. I'm allowed to be happy. I'm always thinking about the morale of everybody around me. I'm always trying to bring everybody's you know, mood up. What about me? I get to bring my mood up too. So if you are a person who has been imprinted with trauma and you've been imprinted with the universe is not a friendly place, it's a hostile place. If you have experienced things throughout your life that have been negative and maybe toxic and you found yourself adapting to them and bringing your entire happiness thermostat down so that your low, you know, your lows are super low and your highs are not very high, they're still pretty low. I highly recommend attending to that. There's a lot of therapists. There are a lot of, you know, personal development programs and products and self-help books. There's a lot of material out there that can help you reevaluate how you see your past and reevaluate, you know, the way that you currently experience your past. There's some really very interesting and powerful neuro-linguistic programming techniques that help you basically have your brain rewrite how you experience the past. It's very powerful. So if you are a person who has acclimated to unhappiness or acclimated to trauma, acclimated to this idea that you're the dumping ground for the universe, it's on you to change that. It's really your responsibility to get into that extroverted process and go, you know what? I think I'm going to go ahead and attend to my needs too. (laughs) I'm going to go ahead and attend to my morale. And I'm going to build some pretty healthy boundaries here that say, you know, I don't really, I'm not a person who's okay with being dumped on anymore. I'm going to create an environment for myself where I'm not taking the hit. Because harmony is not about you throwing yourself under a bus and somebody else getting their way. That's called a win-lose. And that's not real harmony. Real harmony is a win-win. So how do you create a win-win? How do you make sure that you are winning as well as other people and you're not just throwing yourself under a bus? Really keep your finger on the pulse of that martyrdom complex that can show up for people of your type and go, I'm not going to be a martyr. I'm going to be a person who pursues happiness and pursues my happiness and pursues win-wins. And in that way, you'll actually be in a truly harmonious space. So what do you think? You as an ISFJ, we'd love to hear from you, your feedback, questions, comments. You can come over to personalityhacker.com. You can leave a comment directly below this podcast. We'd love to read that and interact with you in real time on our site. You can also join our community on facebook.com forward slash personality hacker or twitter.com forward slash personality hack. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. And if you're in a giving mood, please feel free to leave a rating and review on iTunes. The more rating and reviews that we get over time, the better our chances of being put into their algorithm and higher on their charts and more recommended under other people's podcasts. So if you're in a feeling of a giving mood (laughs) then please feel free to leave a rating review on itunes yeah we can't wait to talk with you on the next personality hacker podcast my name is joel mark witt and i'm antonia dodge we'll talk with you next time